who are dealing with sickness, maybe an injury, suffering in some physical or emotional way. A lot of us know people in our lives right now. In fact, that's part of the reason why we're so short-handed this morning. We had a number of unexpected absences because of illness. And so we're going to lift those people up in our lives that we know this morning in prayer. Um, and also for reconciliation as well. Um, you know, we deal with things in our lives and they can, they can bring trouble, uh, not just for ourselves, but it can bring tension between two people between, in relationships. So we pray for reconciliation this morning. If you know somebody in your life, pray for them. Pray that, pray that God grabs a hold of them and that they're reconciled with him above all first, primarily, and that your relationships are healed or their relationships are healed um, if you're on the outside looking in. So we're going to lift them up in prayer this morning um, as we pray. So pray with me now. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this morning that you've given us. Again, that we can come together lift our voices as one to praise and worship you as you alone are worthy to be praised. And Father, there's so many things that you have done for us above all in reaching your hand down and saving us. We know that this is by your grace for your love for us. Nothing that we've done. And we thank you for this. And we praise you for this above all, and we seek you and you alone and to worship you. Take a moment now and worship our King, who he is. Father, as we know that you are worthy, we know that we often miss the mark. And like sheep going astray, we know that you, good shepherd, that you call your sheep and you bring us back. Father, we ask that at this time that you would show us any way in our lives that we are falling short. Anything that may need to be corrected, Lord, or simply just come back to you. We ask now that you would reveal this to each person here in our own ways, in our own lives. Show us now. Take this moment, ask God for his clarity to reveal to you in, in your life in any, any way. Father, we come to you now and lift our voices together, making our requests known to you. Is the only one who has the power to answer prayer. And this morning, we lift up those people in our lives who are hurting. They're sick, dealing with physical or emotional ailments, Lord. Or maybe there's a need for reconciliation and forgiveness. Father, we lift these people up to you now. Would you place their, your hand upon them, comfort them. We pray for healing. We pray for understanding. But above all, we pray that their eyes remain focused on you through anything. Take a moment and think of those people in your life that you know. 
and lift them up in prayer. Father, as we lift our voices up to you, we know that it is only by your power, by your grace, that anything is done. And so we submit ourselves to your will in all of this, that your will be done. And now we ask for prayer for Pastor Thomas as he comes up here to speak your word. Lord, may you bless him and guide him. As he speaks this morning, we ask this in your son's name. Amen. I don't want to drop that. Good morning. That was a good time praising the king this morning. We have a message today from God, and it's, uh, it's pretty exciting, uh, talking about anger. I want to pray, and then we're going to go through this, this scripture. Father God, we thank you for this word that you have provided. Uh, help us to be uh, discerning, uh, open our hearts and minds. Uh, we're talking about the heart this morning, reconciliation, anger. This is your sermon, Lord, and we get to share it together. Uh, to contemplate what you actually said in the time that you said it. Uh, so help us to have ears uh, to be focused. When our mind starts to wander, uh, whether we got busy things or it's the preacher, uh, bring our, back, our focus back to the Bible that we can just really think about what's being said here today, that you change our hearts and our minds. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would this morning stand, and we're going to uh, read God's word. Let's see how we do this together this morning. I'll lead. I'll be the loudest. You have heard it, that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You may be seated. Again, we are talking about personal relationships. And I say this often, but God is a God of relationships. Um, he is focused on our relationship to him. He's focused on our relationship to each other, especially in the church. We're his little children. And our relationship to the world and what that looks like in our lives, how it impacts our lives. And we also, uh, he focuses in here on uh, murder. This is head turning for the crowd. I know this. This is head turning for the crowd when he speaks here. On anger, talking about insults, calling people names, offering your gift, which is worship is how we look at this. If your brother has something against you, and you know it, we're to be reconciled, and do it quickly is the point. And our introduction this morning is, get your heart right. 
get your heart right. So we're going to talk about how we do that and what that looks like. And, and I want to point out that as we went through, this is, this is Jesus' sermon, right? So God in the flesh, preaching, and it's mind-blowing to me, but he, he focuses on the Beatitudes, and he bookends the Beatitudes. That's the, the behavior and, and attitudes of kingdom citizens, the Beatitudes. Then he goes into salt and light, was our next sermon. And then, and then I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And now he's turning to the crowd, and verses 21 to 48, which are going to be our our next six sermons, what he's bringing to the table is really six corrective illustrations in our heart, in our lives. So Jesus is just really bringing a laser focus to the people around him. And the point and the examples shown in all of them are where we ended on verse 20, last week, is God's righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees. So they deal with specific subjects, lust of the flesh as we go forward, divorce, speaking truth in our relationships, retaliation, loving others, how to do that and what does that look like. They all illustrate the same basic principle. Righteousness, righteousness is a matter of the heart. It's a heart issue. But you might say, yeah, but I remember a verse, there's none righteous but God in heaven. And that's true. But righteousness is a matter of the heart. And we'll be talking about internal righteousness because I'm going to share with you today some of the requirements that God has. And and, and I didn't name them suggestions or um, you know, points that you might consider. They are, they are requirements for kingdom dwellers, for the church, for us filled with the Holy Spirit, and we'll be going into those. And I want to look at uh, Matthew 5, 21 to 22 first. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire, to hell fire. So we're going to uh, look this morning at ourselves. We're going to look at inside and then out because people see the outside. They see the things that we are doing. They, They see our outside behaviors. And unless you're with someone a lot and you see a lot of their behaviors and you hear a lot of their words, you don't truly know their heart. That's why it's so hard for us to judge a person's salvation. They might be just messing up this week and totally saved. For Samuel, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his structure because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God sees on the inside. And this is Jesse lining the boys up before uh, Samuel. David wasn't there yet. You remember the story, some of you, right? And he's lining the boys up, and God says to Samuel, don't look at the outside, this first one. This isn't the one I've chosen. God sees the inside. Another important point here is, is you can't justify yourselves because you've not committed the physical act of murder. Murder goes much deeper than that, and that's, that's what Jesus is doing here. The crowd sitting around him is going, they're nodding, and they're going, yeah, murder. I, I haven't done that. I'm feeling really good about this, this, ser- this sermon coming up because I have not done something like that. I'm not that bad. But murder originates in the heart, and that's the point Jesus is going to flesh out here. Not in the hands. It starts with evil thoughts. And then they become to ruminate on those thoughts. And it goes from the head to the heart to the hands. I know a story of a man, and he was a a new believer. And before he was a new believer, uh, he had hatred in his heart. And he had hatred in his heart for someone who who really hurt him really bad. 
But in that pain and that struggle, God led him to Christ. But see, that hatred in his heart was severe. He wanted to see that person dead. Didn't want him around anymore. Didn't want to talk to him again. Didn't want to interact with him. Wanted him gone. Thought of ways of doing it. And didn't. And that man walked into a church for the first time. And God changed his heart. And one time, he was speaking to friends and said, well, I come out of a worldly life and been quite the pagan, but at least, at least I've, I, I have not murdered anyone. I've done everything else, though, you can imagine. But I never murdered anyone. And the Holy Spirit convicted him in that moment and said, oh, yes, you have. You just haven't read that verse yet. Murder starts in the thinking and in the heart and then finally in the hands. So people can have an anger and a hatred to such a degree that it's their desire to see someone dead. And I know most of you haven't probably hated someone that much. Maybe a few of you have. And yet we, we get angry. We get angry. In John, uh, 1 John 3.15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. I mean, you can come to that verse on its own. You could just pop the Bible, Bible open like we do sometimes. You come to that and you think, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Jesus is making a point, and he's turning this sermon on its head, in a sense, to this crowd around him. Because they're, they're still feeling pretty good, some of them, about the murder statement. No murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And we use the term brother here. It's a sense of a fellow believer in the church. Jesus was using this in that context in a cultural way. It was the Jews were the brothers and sisters. They were Israel. That's your brother. Not speaking to everyone on the planet. And it doesn't mean you get to go be angry at other people that aren't in the church or aren't Jews. But the point is, in the context there, it's a Jewish person in that culture. And there's a danger with anger. In Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. You guys know this verse, most of you. Don't go to bed angry and ruminating on your anger. We also know that he doesn't prohibit anger itself don't we? Do you remember him in the temple? And Jesus got angry? You remember that story. That was a righteous anger. It had to do with, with God. He cleansed the temple. But see, this is, is often abused and, and misapplied. It's possible to have a righteous anger. Faithfulness to Jesus Christ Faithfulness to Jesus Christ will demand it sometimes that we have a righteous anger. And Jesus' faithfulness to his Father, his faithfulness to his Father, and his love for his Father is what made him angry that this was happening. And in our day, I mean, <laughs> we think about where we are in the world right now, and we think of the condition, I think on this a lot, and we think, think of the condition of the church in our culture, in Western culture, and we think of the condition of the world and the condition of public schools and politics and the direction of this nation. And we think on such things, especially in a culture that is focused on positive mental attitude, philosophies, things going on in churches that are not biblical, many churches, We really don't have an excuse for not getting angry at that, getting angry for righteousness' sake. And I think we fall short, perhaps, for just being too passive in this area and not vocalizing that. Sometimes this needs to be challenged. That's not saying to, to challenge it 
with an angry voice because we have other requirements, don't we? To be patient and gentle and kind, to be long-suffering, to be patient with people. Your tone of voice, your body language, how you talk to someone really matters. As, as a counselor, I, I know this. You husbands and you wives, you know this. How we talk to each other really matters. How we start the conversation, it really matters. But we, we need to be angry in the right ways and for the right reasons. And then we need to make stands. And we need to make reconciliation. We need to talk to people about uh, the things that anger us and communicate well. You see, Jesus isn't talking about anger over God being dishonored in this context. This isn't what he's talking about. He's talking about selfish anger. Did we get angry because someone did something against us, perhaps? Or they said something? Or they poked our pride a little bit, perhaps? It's a selfish anger. In this word, in the original language, orgizo, it's, it's to be angry. It has to do with a brooding, with, with a, a brooding, to be chewing on this, to be sparking it and, and setting it afire. It's a simmering anger. It's nurtured. It's not allowed to die. You keep thinking on it. You keep bringing it back. It festers. It's holding a grudge. It's cherishing the resentment. Maybe someone's enjoying that. Maybe someone enjoys being angry. It doesn't want reconciliation. And the writer in Hebrews, he calls this the, the root of bitterness, right? The root of bitterness. Jesus says this form of anger is murder. This form of anger is murder, and that person will be guilty before the court. And there's a danger in slander as well. So we're talking about angry first. <clears throat> and, and Jesus does this in three levels, in three degrees. As he starts through this, you'll notice there's anger. You'll, you'll notice there's, uh, depending on your version, there's raka or... or uh, It'll also just say um, fool in the end. So it's angry and, and, and raka, you idiot, you numbskull, you blockhead. And then, and then he uses the word fool. Three different fool, or three different uh, words in this. And, and, uh, and he's showing them at different degrees. And then, and then the punishment and the judgment at three different degrees too. And you wouldn't notice this depending on what version you looked at unless you, you studied through this verse here. And it's... Um, Raka, this word, and I believe that's in the NIV. Uh, it's been translated brainless, idiot, worthless, silly fool, silly fool, blockhead, meathead. Remember meathead on Archie? Yeah. He probably wasn't using it at that level, but the contemptuous person will be guilty before the Supreme Court. So the first one who's angry, it's the court. The second one who's angry, it's the Supreme Court. which is the Sanhedrin, the Council of Seventy, the Supreme Court. So it's a higher level court. They knew what Jesus was talking about when he said this. In the fool word, this is uh, moros, means stupid or dull. And in the Greek culture, it could mean godless person as well. So you're a godless person. You're an idiot. Um, very contemptuous. It's to accuse someone of being both stupid and godless. So three, three levels and degrees he's showing here, and, and Raka is even more serious than the first, and the worst is fool, to get, condemn a person's character, to call them a fool. And those were also uh, foolish people, were also court jesters at one time. And you know who the court jesters are today? Don't give me political names. <laughs> But the court jesters are the actors on TV. They're pretending, the pretenders. They would entertain the king in the court, right? I'm not calling all the actors fools. I'm just saying that's, that's how this word has moved through, through time and culture. 
Um, they're the fools, and, and now we lift these actors and many of these people up like, they're, uh, like we worship them, like they're little gods, court jesters. And the Psalms tell us twice that uh, the fool has said in his heart there's no God. The fool has said in his heart there's no God. So we have an obligation. We have an obligation when we know somebody is living their life this way. We have an obligation when we um, realize someone is living foolishly. And what would living foolishly be? As we look at, finish with these two verses, the first ones is, is uh, rejecting Christ. Because that's the only way that we get the righteousness. Because there's none righteous. So ultimately we're talking about Christ's righteousness, but I'll, I'll get into that more deeply in a minute. Our first uh, growing point this morning is God requires internal righteousness. It's a requirement. Do you think you can get yourself there, though? I mean, that's something to think about and discuss. You think you can get there. Internal righteousness, made right before God completely. He said that to call someone a fool and to have that bitterness and contention for someone made him guilty enough to go into fiery hell. And that hell word, and, and you know it's used often through scripture, and, and it has different uh, meanings. They just choose hell in, in the English. But it's Gehenna. It's uh, Jerusalem, southwest. So if that was Cabela's going that way, it was a dump. It was a big dump heat that smoldered constantly, and they just threw dump stuff on it. And it just smoldered and burned and was fire and smoking all the time. And that's the word that that he's using here. To call a person a fool is the same as cursing him and murdering him, is what Jesus is saying. And you're all still probably feeling pretty good that you haven't hated somebody that much and been that angry at somebody. And that's the crowd that was around Jesus. They were feeling pretty good too. They're like, yeah, we got this. The Pharisees around him knew what he was saying. But I have to say this morning, if you're here and you don't know Christ, this is the truth of what happens when you're separated from Christ. So not just calling someone a name or being someone that, 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 that angry, having murder and hatred in your heart. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you have a destination for eternity and it's not with him in heaven. And we have a slide up there, uh, our prayer example. I just want to take a moment this morning I just want to take a moment right now and, and uh, I want to pray uh, a salvation prayer. And if you're already saved, this is you recommitting. Uh, let's pray for someone if they're here today and God brought them divine appointment to hear this message today. We are so thankful that they're here. Father God, we know, Lord, that as sinners we can come before you and repent. And to repent is to have a godly sorrow and to turn away from sin in our life. We believe, Lord, that you were born of a virgin and died on the cross. And on the third day, you rose again. And to believe that in, in our hearts and to confess our sins and to confess with our mouth that you have risen and you are Lord is to be saved. You say that we shall be saved. So it's coming to that intellectual knowledge that moves to our heart to actually believe that in our heart in the seat of our emotions and to confess that with our mouth and to confess to others that truth. We pray for salvation this morning, Lord, for whoever's here and is not saved and for the rest of us, Lord, that we take that same message to everybody you put in front of us with right opportunities and gentleness. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 5, 23 to 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This is crucial to your worship. The altar they're talking about is the worship. This is, this is you going through the courts with the animal and putting your hands on the animal with the priest is the context they're understanding it as he says it here. But, but for us, it's Sunday services. 
For us, it's seven days a week worship. It's everything we do in Jesus' name and, and as we talk to him and love him and love others. And this is all worshiping God. Singing up front is, is praising him. But everything that we do in our walk with him is worship. And he wants you to stop in your tracks. He wants you to not sacrifice the animal. He wants you to run away from the altar and run back to your brother or sister when he brings to mind a way perhaps you've sinned them, uh, sinned against them and hurt them. What he's doing is, as, as Jesus is teaching this, he's shattering their self-righteousness. He knew who he was speaking to. He knew the Pharisees and the Sadducees and members of the Sanhedrin were around him. He was speaking to the scholars and the legalists and the shepherd and the unsaved and those lacking in knowledge. He was showing that the guilty are worthy of hell. And when they heard him speaking about murder, they were feeling good until he said, if you have been that angry with someone in your heart, you've committed murder. And their mouths must have dropped open. And he said, worship is important to Israel back then. Very, very important. Everything focused around it. And he said, if you're getting ready to worship, drop it. Leave the altar and run to your brother. God is focused on relationship. Jesus continues to focus on this sin of hatred against his brother. That it's that important that we reconcile. And they weren't thinking that this kind of thinking, they weren't thinking this kind of thinking, that that was sin. Their thought life. They hadn't gone there. I want to make this important point, and then I don't want to rabbit trail with it because it's real easy. So they had, they had softened and minimized the court system and the penalty for murder that is from, from Exodus and the Ten Commandments. There was death for murder, and they turned it into a, a court system with different levels, and you would be judged by that court system, and rarely it became that rarely the 70 of the Sanhedrin would, would put someone to death for some penalties, and others they would. They began to soften the law with their traditions. And it's because they had put it at an outward level. They had gone outward with it, like an outward action. And that's not what it was. It was an act against God. To hate someone and murder someone is an act against God, someone created in his image. So they had softened the teaching, the punishment for the teaching. And they weren't thinking when he was saying this that that is sin, their thought life. Jesus carries that on with how we look in lust, what we think in our head. But they weren't thinking that at this time. Leave your offering there before the altar. God said something interesting in Isaiah. and I don't have it up there for you, but I was thinking about this last night. And God said, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? Question mark. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? Says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of cattle and I take no pleasure in. He said, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Don't do evil anymore. Stop doing evil. That's Isaiah chapter 1 for reference. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. What is all this offering stuff, this worship stuff? You've turned it into this. And you fail and fall short in the relationships. I'm a God of relationships, he's saying. So any sort of sin, any animosity, it affects the integrity 
in our worship. What, what is God saying to you? We're not doing the offerings and the animals in that. What did God say to me <laughs> as I study through this? Because we get convicted before you hear it. He said, if, if, if you have anger towards a brother or sister, if you know they have something against you, if you have a relationship that's messed up in the church, go deal with that. Don't go to Sunday service. Skip Sunday service and worship and go to their home and ask them to forgive you. Go to their home and tell them you want to forgive them. Go tell them that you love them. Don't go to church and worship. It's not just communion we skip. Don't even come here. Go to them. That's what God is saying. Psalm 66. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. God requires reconciliation. It's that important. And I know you guys like me are thinking about family members and things in your lives where there's not reconciliation. We can't always reconcile to the world, but we're talking the church, the context. That context on the mount was Israel. The context for us is the church. But still, we have a responsibility with neighbors and loving them and responsibilities in the world with enemy. Five, 25 to 26. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court lest, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. What is he meaning by that? Reconciliation to an, an opponent. Someone to get, it doesn't matter who was right or wrong in the beginning, but it's, it's gotten to the point where it's gone to the court system. And we should never have to take each other to court in the church. We should always be able to resolve these things, right? I'm seeing nodding, right? Yeah. We should usually be able to work these things out together, not going to court. Also important to understand that there is a difference in how we treat uh, a brother or sister in Christ, and there's a difference in how we treat, keep track of my time, I got lots of time, um, keep track of, uh, keep track of my time, how we deal with a brother and sister in Christ and how we deal with uh, the world and people in the world. Because in Christ, as brothers and sisters, and this, this doesn't happen much in churches, um, but we will do it here when, when we have to, uh, church discipline, um, and we will deal with that. Uh, so we, we hold accountable brothers and sisters in Christ to be biblical, uh, to, to not go into to false teaching, unorthodoxy, uh, unhealthy relationships, all these things that we have to deal with in church. You might be surprised, but we do. Uh, and we will deal with a brother or sister in Christ who claims Christ differently than we will deal with people outside the world because the church is called and has requirements to God and outside in the world, they are pagans being pagans. They're, they're lost and they're not filled with the Holy Spirit and, and we're called to love them. Our relationship to our neighbor, to our enemy, is to love them and that's our behavior, how we treat them and, and how we, uh, but we don't, we don't hold them accountable and go after them for their behaviors. We take the gospel to them. So our focus on people outside the church is to love them and share the gospel. And then it's up to Jesus. And on top of that, so the counselor says in me is, is have healthy boundaries too. <laughs> you have to have healthy boundaries so that you don't fall too. But in the church, we hold each other accountable. That's what we're supposed to do. We can't let things in the church and behaviors in the church and just turn our, our blind eye to it. We have to hold people accountable um, lovingly and help them and restore them and encourage them to keep the church pure. So when is the time for reconciliation? Now, that's what God's saying. 
When is the time for salvation? Now. Now's the time for salvation. Now's the time for reconciliation. We're not to hold bitterness and anger and hatred. We don't let that separate us. So we need to talk to each other, lift each other up, encourage each other, stand beside each other, discipling each other, mentoring each other. That's what the church looks like. And it keeps us from this kind of thinking, this stinking thinking, and then it, then it ruminating in the heart and settling in there and then festering and smoldering because we're confessing to one another our sins. This is how the church has been built, and this is what the New Testament teaches all the way through to the end is how we handle our relationships and how we do this. So being thrown into prison and not being able to get out that's really an analogy of, of God's punishment. If you go to that level and you're a murderer, just like as if you murdered someone and you don't have Christ in you, you, you will go to hellfire. So, are you asking if it's forgivable? You should be asking if it's forgivable. It is forgivable. Murder is forgivable. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit and rejecting Christ is not forgivable. Everything else can be forgiven. There's another side of it, and that's Christ coming into you, recommitting to Christ, getting our, ourselves right. We call this in, in recovery ministry as well, uh, doing a fourth step, making amends. And it's really important that we make amends with each other, and if we've wronged someone, that we go back and, and talk to them. Because you, when you're working in recovery and you're a recovery counselor like myself too and, and uh, you're helping people reconcile in their relationships. So we get our relationship right with our brother and then we can get our relationship right with God. And he forgives in Christ Jesus. He forgives us. Can we ever have the right attitude all the time I can't I'm trying to but I can't I, I fall short we don't always get the right attitude we don't always deal with things the right way whether it's uh, face to face sometimes people the people closest to us the people we love the most are the ones we hurt we're dancing with them we step on their toes uh, but it's forgivable We can't reach God's perfect standard. And that's the point of repentance. We can't be perfectly righteous. But in Christ we are. We have an inter eternal uh, and internal righteousness. Which is Christ. It all belongs to him. Apart from him we got nada. It's all his. And he gets the glory. And Jesus' final point in this is the growing point is God requires immediate action. He wants this to happen now. What a remarkable message that the Lord gave. If we have Christ's righteousness, we'll refrain from shed, shedding blood, we'll refrain from having anger and, and contemplating someone being dead, murdering them in our mind and our heart. Everything Jesus teaches in this, this passage. And in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, all the way to the end, where they marvel, and, and we'll get to that in some weeks, but they, they say, who is this? He speaks with authority. Wow, what a message. They're just going, wow. Turned everything on its head. If we're guilty of offending another, may we... Make a covenant with God to reconcile that relationship. And I really want you to have healthy boundaries in doing these things. These are hard things. But you need to protect yourself and your family. We're not always able to go back to somebody in the past. Sometimes it would be very unhealthy. Some of us have done terrible things before Christ. Some of us have grown up in the church and 
felt like, I wish I had a more terrible thing to talk about. Wouldn't I have a great testimony? <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard that. It's like, yeah, I, I have a testimony doing terrible things. But I'd rather have your testimony, growing up and loving Jesus your whole life, too. You know, so we're funny when we talk like that, and we do as brothers and sisters. I've heard that a new, numerous times, but um, it's, not, it's not good to have those memories. It's terrible. It, you have to forgive yourself the rest of your, your life, knowing God forgave you, but you just, you just work on that stinking thinking stuff. And The point is we want to become, we want to become peacemakers. Spiritual warfare, remember uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Spiritual warfare. Put on the whole armor of God. Helmet of salvation. Breastplate of righteousness. Belt of truth. Sword is the word of God. And it says, to shod, New King James Version, maybe King James 2, to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on the gospel of peace. Everywhere you go, put on the gospel of peace. In doing so, you're becoming... The peacemaker. We're to be the best lovers of people on the planet. To love them. All of them. And to be peacemakers. And God wants, Jesus wants, us to do that in this family. Here are the church. Brothers and sisters. We're going to be together forever. I'm not going to say sorry about that. It's going to be great. But we're, we're going to be together forever. It's, it's a faith family. I, I love that thought. Our conclusion is be a peacemaker. Romans 12, 18. If possible. This is important. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. We can't always do that, can we? In other countries, there's people that want to come and kill you because you're a Christian. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So we have five more sermons covering these points before Jesus goes into the rest of his sermon on our behaviors in other areas. And, but he's going to make these, these critical points and it turns everything on its head. And it's going to be really really fun to go through, so I, I hope you come back and go through them with us. Our growing points this morning. Get your heart right. God requires internal righteousness. God requires reconciliation. God requires immediate action. He's saying do it, do it now and be a peacemaker. I did it in enough time, too. We're going to have communion time together. So much more. There's so much more uh, you can study on this. You have some follow-through information in your, your sheet there. And there's a lot of clippings on the floor from studying this this week. We can just talk about so much. But that's your job this week. You go, go look at this first and study it. We're going to have time of communion, and John's going to come. I think he's prepared. Yeah, he's preparing. You guys, you guys know how to do this, most of you. And if you're here and you don't know, uh, there's information in your bulletin. Uh, but you just jump in the line and follow the one in front of you because they do know. Is you're going to go to the back of the room and you're going to come up the wall and the elements are here on the side. They're actually um, unleavened little cracker breads that we use now, separated so you don't have to touch anyone else's. And uh, let's go ahead and... Stand up, if you would, and let's go to the back. And We're going to have this time of communion and celebration together.
imagining that, that night where they were gathered in that upper room. I just love reading and studying that time they had together and the teachings of Christ from that time. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Wonderful time together this morning. If you're able, stand slowly, and we're going to read the blessing together. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Amen. If you would like prayer this, mo- this morning, we have people from the prayer team that are able to come up this morning and they would love to pray with you and hear about what's going on in your life. So you- you're dismissed this morning. Go out into the world, make a difference, share the gospel.
So I lay down my plans, I give up, I rise, let you take control of the surrendered life. 